Hello and welcome to the Badger Talks podcast, the podcast that shares interviews with experts from the University of Wisconsin-Madison community about their work, research, and a little bit about what they're like as people, too. I'm your host, Buzz Kemper, and today we are focusing on research and community and how to bridge and strengthen both of those. And my guests are Kat Phelps with the Wisconsin Network for Research Support and Corey Sprinkle with the Mortgage Center for Public Service. Corey and Kat, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank oh, you're you. welcome. It's wonderful to be invited. Corey, let me start with you. The whole idea here is that we have these images of what research is, right? It's, it's, it's somebody in the ivory tower. It's somebody in a lab, either at a university or a private research facility. It's computer modeling. It's maybe surveys. We have these kinds of images. But you are focusing on engaging community in the research process to both benefit research and benefit the communities themselves. I mean, this is this is something that I was not aware of, and I want to be aware of it. So what? how does this work, and, and, uh, and how do you do it? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's definitely not the norm, I think, when we think about the college experience. Um, so I work at the Mortgage Center for Public Service, and we kind of serve all of campus in trying to really connect campus and community um, through a variety of mechanisms. So we work with Uh, undergraduate students who are going out through direct service, like volunteering. Um, I also work to support community-based learning classes where students are really getting out and active, hands-on with the community. Um, And that's that's a great partnership when students can be out um, learning more about the community and the community organizations that they might be working with hopefully are getting a a real-life project or an outcome that helps them move their work forward. Um, And so when we think about community-engaged research, um, it's that that same sort of lens and thinking about how can we build an institution, uh, the University of Wisconsin being a a public university, um, the Wisconsin idea being this guiding uh, concept that we all talk about, um, what would it look like for research to really meet the Wisconsin idea by being uh, responsive to and crafted ideally in collaboration with community? Um, so I think that's what uh, myself and Kat as well are really focused on doing is, is leveraging uh, the powers and the knowledge at the university and the energy um, and bridging that with the same knowledge, energy, and expertise that exists in the community um, to really produce robust and, and positive outcomes for hopefully everybody. Okay. So give me an example. So you're you're the student person. You, you interact with students primarily. And Kat, I know that you are more involved in the health research uh, area, and we're going to get to that in a moment. But so, Corey, give me an example of how this works. So, so I mean, obviously, you don't just tell students, go out in the community and learn stuff. Uh, so how, how specifically does this, does this begin, and, and how do you direct the students uh, as to what it is they're looking for and what it is they're trying to achieve? Yeah, I appreciate you asking that question. I think it's very easy, and it, that's how we've honestly historically done a lot of things. It's like, oh, just send students out, and everything else will follow and flow. And that's just not the case. Um, We know from ample data and and experience working with community partners in Madison, but also, you know, at a national level, other universities that are doing this. um, Oftentimes, when we do it that traditional way, just sending students out, it's more harmful, it takes, it's more burdensome to community partners. Um, So that's actually a, a, a area of expertise or specification in some of my work. Um, My colleague uh, Haley Madden and Beth Tryon and I recently just co-authored a book, um, Preparing Students to Engage in Equitable Community Partnerships. Um, There really is a lot of of curricular time and uh, and orienting that students need in order to engage in that community work in a really meaningful and impactful way. Um, So the book and in my work like looks a lot about how do we best orient students for that partnership. Um, and in a classroom, that means uh, ensuring that the instructor has strong relationships with their community partner um, and that there's an ability and interest in understanding community context um, and community identified needs and how the class or, or course content can kind of be responsive or in communication with those things. And Kat, let's let's look at your end of this deal. So Corey works mainly with students. You are involved more in health research. So 
with whom are you working and how are you bridging this gap? Sure. So the uh, organization I work with um, really works at the intersection of health and equity and community. So how do we bridge what's happening at a university and the expertise that's come from um, education and experience through learning in a formal setting with the expertise that lives in people who are closest to many of the issues that some of the faculty are studying? And how do we get that lived experience to um, in fact, inform the questions and the design and the studies that are being done. So the work I do is both with community members and with faculty and finding ways to bring them together in conversation to, um, you know, as I've said, bridge that lived experience with that um, academic expertise. Can you give us an example of an, an instance where you've done this and you the the process was X and the result was 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 Y? Sure. Just um, uh, last week, um, I drove up with my colleague to um, Forest County, where uh, a person who's a cardiologist here at UW, Anupama Joseph, is working with um, Potawatomi Tribal Council to identify ways to strengthen than heart health. And so um, she knew that... Specifically, sorry, specifically in the Native American community or or in general? specifically for the Potawatomi tribe. Interesting. So she knew that coming in with um, sort of book learning was not going to be appropriate for designing and implementing a program to support that health. So she set up a series of meetings with the tribal... um, People identified as having either heart issues themselves or family members and some elders of the tribe to talk about what makes sense to you as a project, a program, something we can both implement within the community but also in the clinic that's there to support heart health. And um, all of us learned that even the way we set up the first meeting was needed to dramatically change to be responsive to the culture, the um, traditions, and the the way that we need to listen and be culturally um, have humility to stop what we originally planned and just absorb what they had to offer. And it was powerful and a really exciting program is going to come out of it. So obviously this goes beyond its boundaries. You find out not only about heart health issues within the Potawatomi tribe, but you're also finding out probably a lot of other things that, you know, oh, gosh, we weren't aware of that. Right. Right. Okay. I think one of the things that is um, such a funny first step that seems obvious in retrospect, but is that people from the university shouldn't be setting up the meeting agendas. They should be asking, how would you like to have this first meeting? What is important to you? Would you work with us to craft what our plan might be and instead of coming in with an agenda set? Yeah, I, I, to- yeah, I totally get that. That makes, that makes sense. Let them kind of lead the, the direction because they may have a direction in which they want to go. Are there heart health issues that are specific to the Potawatomi. Yeah, we talk about um, health disparities as differences in health outcomes um, that are are striking and are avoidable, hmm. right? So um, when you look at um, the tribal discrepancies or disparities, um, cardiac health is one that mm-hmm. is something that you can work to change um, and is different in their population than in other populations. Wow. Yeah, fascinating. And yeah, and this is, uh, this is all stuff that uh, I was not aware of, and uh, you are helping make us aware of it. And, uh, and I imagine that this is actually, the goal is to lead to actual solutions to these, to these heart-related problems. Oh, absolutely. And to acknowledge that the solutions come from within the community. The solutions are matching the the academic knowledge and technology and 
practices with the traditions and the um, wisdom that comes from the people and the lives they've been living. Hmm, that is terrific. Now, Corey, I'll turn back to you. Can you, can you, uh, like uh, like Kat just did, can you give us uh, an example of one of your programs and how it how it began and where it has led or is leading if it's still in progress? Yeah, definitely. So. I talked a little about community-based learning, um, and each semester, I'd say U- UW Madison has for between sixty to seventy community-based learning courses. Uh, and again, these are those courses where students uh, are having generally about twenty-five hours of active engagement with a community partner. That might be direct, like right out with them. Maybe they're doing tutoring. Uh, they might be doing um, more work on like a project and a communications plan. I oversee a group of students uh, that we call community-based learning interns um, who get to consult with some of those classes and kind of provide curricular support, uh, teaching support um, in a variety of ways, kind of connected to that orientation piece, orienting students to community engagement and and what that learning experience is and how it's different than the traditional lecture style, um, maybe more passive learning that is um, a common trope of of higher education. But so my students really have uh, a great set of experiences working with a number of instructors across campus, pretty much all the all the schools and and colleges that we have. Um, Some good examples that come to mind is a a civil engineering capstone. Um, So this is taught by uh, Jan Kucher and Derek Hungness. And this is a, you know, civil engineers, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, technical information that they need in order to do their work, but what they often aren't getting in their in their engineering curriculum is that hands-on tactical experience, the, the opportunity to think about how does my engineering work impact communities and impact society. Um, so one, our, I have interns that go out and facilitate conversation with these, uh, with these students who are working on um, very a, a vast vari- variety of civil engineer product, uh, projects, and I'm not an engineer, so I'm probably butcher might butcher any attempts to to reiterate what some of those are. But some of these are projects that are coming from local municipalities, um, from you know small towns or community partners that have a need that you know where else can you get affordable like engineering consulting? That is not a cheap thing to come by, especially for nonprofits that might be lacking resources. Um, so that civil engineering course connects with another uh, one of our colleagues on campus, the Gavin Luter and the University Alliance, um, which is a, a UW sort of community engagement commitment program um, matching local government to UW resources. Um, and so I think the opportunities that come through that for those engineers are really transformative and, and more hands-on and active than some of their other engineering experiences. Another example, uh, I'll try and I'll be I'll try to be briefer, is uh, an English professor, Carolyn Gottschick Dretzky, who focuses heavily. Um, her her research focuses on like rhetoric. She has been doing um, a project in the western part of Wisconsin for a few years now, um, in areas that were heavily impacted by um, flooding. And I think I think it was 2018 when we had those really bad floods. Um, and so Caroline and her students are doing an oral history project to stories from the flood to better understand this community and connect that to water issues and how, you know, water in our climate are changing and how does that impact communities. So really innovative and, and robust research. And I think it's it's work that, you know, I think people think of departments like English sometimes and they don't understand what research might look like in that space. Um, but this really hands-on, um, engaged work that can be possible when we make the resource of the university available and in communication with our communities. Okay. Th- th- thank you both for those examples. So it's, I think, a little bit um, uh, opaque for people to try to imagine how does research, you know, community-based research, you know, how does that actually manifest itself and what are the results? But then when you say, well, when you've got civil engineers, you know, designing a community, maybe talk to the people who live there. That is so, that is so eminently just logical and sensible. Um, I absolutely love it and help, you know, help the, the Potawatomi with, uh, with, with heart related issues. That's uh, absolutely amazing. How did 
this idea again it seems so so completely logical and sensible that of course we would do this but it hasn't always been done um and so how and i'll let either one of you tackle this but how did this come about specifically at uw Sure, I'll give it a I'll give it a go. All right, Corey, um, it's, it's you. You're in you, you're in the hot seat. <laughs> I'm thinking a lot about colleagues on campus um, who do great work. So Casey Lucini Butcher with the Center for Campus History um, has really been exploring UW's history and um, maybe parts of our history that we've swept under the rug or are more uncomfortable to talk about. Mm. Um, so you know, going back to University of Wisconsin's founding, and don't get me wrong, I love this institution, but we're founded on stolen indigenous land. Madison is uh, on Ho Chunk territory, mm-hmm. um, and so you know, when you look at those roots, recognizing that uh, creating this institution required p- literally pushing people out and driving them from their homes, um, and thinking about how that has occurred for other communities. So. Um, not a UW Madison example, but you know f- your listeners might be familiar with the Tuskegee syphilis experiment um, and these other um, r- relationships with uh, between communities and researchers that have historically been really harmful yeah. um, and that have led to a lot of distrust. And I think we look at the the environment around higher education now um, and around you know media, and there's a lot of distrust. Um, and and I think in inst- universities and research institutions have to look at what role they've played in contributing to that mm. that distrust and, and seeking to remedy it. Anything to add, Kat? Yeah, there's an interesting um, convergence, I would say, right now. Um, in 2017, there was a study that came out that on average, it takes 17 years for a scientific um, discovery that's at the basic science level to move from there to human clinical trials and then to actual practice and to outcomes that affect people's lives wow. in community and in, a, in practice. It's a slow moving 17 thing. years. So yeah. um, one of the things that can shrink that distance is to get early and frequent input from the end users, from people who are going to be um, hopefully benefiting from that research. So that alone along with um, COVID-19, which laid bare tremendous um, racial inequities in health and in our system, in how it supports people unequally, uh, along with um, sort of a new energy from funders. NIH is now talking how important community voice is in research. So those three things kind of all came together to highlight and spotlight how important it is to really, um, at all stages, from the early development of the questions to the design and conduct of the research, and then getting the results out and making the change happen in practice, um, that community voice can improve that entire process, and that, um, in fact, it's essential to making it happen well. Wow. That's, yeah, it, this just makes so much sense. And I can see where it is just going to benefit both both ends of the spectrum, the, the, the researchers and the communities um, who the, you know, the research is going to and the results of the research are going to impact. Uh, that is so terrific. Um, thank you both. Before I let you go, I just want to find out, what do you do when you're not working all this research stuff? Do you have, uh, do you have hobbies, interests? Interests? Um, do you do you run marathons? What do you do? I do not run marathons. I have watched a husband do that and decided that is not a good idea for me. Um, <laughs> okay, I I love um, reading and baking. I would say if they're two things that are close to my heart, and um, read a lot of nonfiction. I will say and I eat a lot of sugar. All so right. that's what what's, happens. <laughs> all right. What's your what's your favorite thing to to bake and eat? Oh, what do I love baking? You know, I love baking to also give other people joy. So some of the favorite things in my extended family are my carrot cake. Ah. Um, that gets a lot of pluses. And then um, kind of cookies of all sorts. All right. And go. carrot cake, I mean, that's healthy. You can food. call it healthy. That's healthy food. Carrots it's in got it. carrots. Right, right, right. I, it, of course. That is, it's in the name. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, what about you? Yeah. Um, you know, similar things, I, I think. You uh, bake Matt, carrot cake too? No, I, I bake. I, I don't. 
don't know if I did. I haven't done a carrot cake lately. Um, I'd love some of yours, Kat. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, I love uh, Madison. So I like to be out like in the food scene. Um, it's restaurant week right now. So went out for lunch with some coworkers yesterday. Um, and out, uh, also I'm a organizer with LGBT books to prisoners, um, in, in here in Madison. Um, so that takes up some of my time. Um, and really just, yeah, being out, out in, in nature, live near the Arboretum as well. And, and that's always a good, yeah, we've run place. into each yeah. other in the Arboretum. Yeah. That's a happy coincidence. Yeah. I, I, I live nearby too, and I make, uh, make good, uh, good use of it. Is there anything that you feel like is important to to be said about this this community based research and perhaps i haven't asked the right question well definitely something i want to plug um and cat will have to chime in as well um uh, so an effort that we've been working on uh so last year uh, my colleagues and i in the mortgage center as well with, with colleagues across campus um kicked off our, our inaugural what we're what we've deemed the wisconsin idea conference um which is really just an opportunity to to bring these same discussions that we're having now th- those stakeholders together um it is uh open to the public, um, free to the public, um, and really intended to bring community and researchers together to think through how we improve partnerships, lessons learned, um, really practical skills and, and, and partnerships. So that takes place um, April 9th, um, but we've also expanded beyond just the one-day conference to uh, Wisconsin Idea Week, which will include a, a variety of events um, from campus partners like the um, – School of Human Ecology's commu- Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies um, will be doing. Uh, uh, <laughs> These names get kind of cumbersome. <laughs> I know. I'll be doing their acronyms. Right, um, right, exactly. Listeners, bear with me. <laughs> um, but that, that, con- uh, their, their civil. Civic Health of Wisconsin Conference um, will also be taking place that week, as well as um, other events from the Center for Healthy Minds. Um, I believe the uh, a mapping unit in the in the Center for Geography um, mm. is doing something as well. Um, and then Kat is is really working together with her community advisory boards. Sure. So there are um, over a dozen advisory boards affiliated with UW. Mm-hmm. So they they advise in all sorts of arenas. But um, members from those different boards are planning out two events. One is a um, mixer at the South Madison Partnership on the morning after the full day Wisconsin Idea Conference. And it's just to have uh, researchers and advisory board members learn about what they do. So many researchers don't even know of the standing advisory board members they may have access to. Um, So to bridge that, and then also on Saturday, there's a Just for Community party that is happening. Um, uh, We are are deciding between the Public Library and Warner Park Community Center, so to be determined. But um, When you you say Saturday, do you mean this Saturday? I mean the 13th, so (laughs) April 13th, sorry, following the conference. Great, okay, great. um, And (laughs) that. There's one sort of closing um, remark I'd like to make, which was a powerful conversation I just had with somebody um, named Yinka Shamboa, and she was saying that um, when she wanted to work with a specific community, and it wasn't a community she had a strong relationship with, she um, went to them and asked, what can I do for you? Mm. Um, And they said, well, we'd really like a talk on this. And so she did that talk. And then a month later, she went and said, what can I do for you? She said, well, we'd really like to learn more about this. It wasn't something she knew about, so she had to do some research to come back. She went back, and what can I do for you? And her research team said, well, are you going to be asking them about our project um, when you go this time? And her answer was, not yet. And the point of that is that creating relationship before there is any ask Mm -hmm is such a good practice Mm -hmm. and we're not used to it because we're so excited about our studies and to be fair the university um, uh, rewards speed of publications grant funding you know there's not a kicked back life in the tenure track um, version of a professor's Mm -hmm. existence so but but in order to do community engaged work well you must establish a real offering and relationship before there's any ask yeah yeah that's really really good uh good advice and and a good way of thinking of things everyone wants to be heard 
before you start telling them what it is that you want. Um, yeah, makes perfect sense. One little addition I'll add too is that um, you know, Kat spoke well to the to the the role that researchers have to play in that in that side of the relationship. I think as a whole, as an institution, we also need to get better at being accessible to community who have great, rich research questions and and Im- immense amounts of data that that go untapped. Um, and so, you know, to any community partners or or you know, in, in invested citizens that are listening to this podcast, you know, feel free to to find to reach out to places I think like this the Margaret Center for Public Service. We're really well poised to to do what we can to connect um, community members to all the resources on campus. And really in that way that Kat emphasized, hoping that relationships come first and then the the robust partnerships will will fall into place after. Great. Yeah, this it really seems like a, a, just a terrific idea, and as I said earlier, just eminently sensible and logical, and uh, and I can see where this is going to lead to, and has led to, really pra- good practical results that are are genuinely helpful to humans in their communities. Uh, terrific stuff. Uh, Kat Phelps with the Wisconsin Network for Research Support and Corey Sprinkle with the Mortgage Center for Public Service. Thank you so much uh, for appearing. I've, I've learned a lot from this. What a treat. You're welcome and thanks. Thank you. Liz. You've been listening to the Badger Talks podcast. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Corey Sprinkle and Kat Phelps. Please browse our previous episodes for other topics that may be of interest to you. The Badger Talks podcast is a creation of UW Connects and produced at Audio for the Arts Recording Studios in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm Buzz Kemper. Thank you for listening. Thank you.